these things. Uh, I'm Nancy Gallagher. I'm the interim director of the Center for International and Security Studies at, here at the School of Public Policy. And I'm pleased to welcome you, our audience, and Derek Scholett and uh, Lawrence Korb, our surrogates, um, to what I think will be a really interesting evening, having them uh, represent the candidates' positions on foreign policy. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be able to do this because I teach a class on international security policy. My students are constantly being asked by me, well, what advice would you give the next administration? And they're always looking at me like this is a completely crazy question. But they also frequently looked at me with frustration because they don't often know enough about what the candidates think about foreign policy issues to be able to make informed recommendations. So I think it's a great opportunity to come away from sort of the circus that a lot of the campaign is um, and have a really substantive discussion about international policy. Um, if you're interested in learning more about CISM, what we do and the kinds of programs that we run, you can go to our website, www.cism.umd.org, uh, and subscribe to our updates there. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Trader Parsi, who's the president of the National Iranian American Council and our partner in this debate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nancy. My name is Trita Parsi. I'm the president of the National Iranian American Council. Delighted to have you all here. Delighted to have this opportunity to work with the center uh, to put on this debate. Um, I don't think you have to be a Republican or a Democrat or whether you're a Bernie or a Clinton supporter. Uh, I think it's quite clear, very difficult for people to disagree, that at least on the Democratic side, the debate has been very substantive and very penetrating, and we've actually gotten a chance to get much deeper into the issues with a lot of nuance. However, on foreign policy, we thought that there was still some distance to go and that there's an opportunity to go further deep into this, particularly mindful of the fact that I think it's quite clear that whoever is the next president of the United States will have a significant impact on the direction of the United States in, when it comes to foreign policy. Just looking at uh, from what we had during the George W. Bush years of a war on terror uh, to a shunning of diplomacy to what we have under the Obama administration with a pivot to the East and an embrace and a deliberate effort to reinstate diplomacy at the very center of American foreign policy, there's clearly uh, a tremendous a, a spectrum that exists within the country but also within the Democratic Party. So here we're hoping to be able to get an opportunity to get deeper into the issues. Where, what should the United States position be, for instance, on the Israeli-Palestinian issue? How should we deal with the terrorism and the uh, jihadism that currently uh, is ravaging through the Middle East and beyond that? Should the United States normalize relations with Iran? How do we deal with Russia, with China, with other rising powers and the, and the future global order? And tonight we're hoping to be able to get deeper into those issues, and we're delighted to have Indira Lakshmanan with us as the moderator to be able to guide us through this conversation, who is a two-decade uh, veteran journalist, uh, been serving for Bloomberg for quite some time, now currently with NPR. I saw her a lot because she did an amazing job covering the nuclear talks with Iran last summer and, and beyond. Uh, and she's going to be moderating and tell, introducing both our wonderful speakers as well as the rules for the evening. Thank you so Thank much, you. Trita. Um, I first just have to correct one thing. I'm not with NPR. I guest host NPR programs, and I contribute to Politico magazine, so I don't want to leave a wrong impression. Affiliations are important. Um, I first want to introduce our two debaters. Derek Cholet, who will be debating um, for Hillary Clinton, is counselor and senior advisor for security and defense policy at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. He also writes a monthly column at Defense One that you can check out. And previously, he was U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. He managed U.S. defense policy towards Europe, including NATO. And I first met him when he worked for Hillary Clinton as a senior director for strategic planning um, well, first he was on her policy planning staff at the State Department, and then he worked for President Obama in the White House as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Strategic Planning. Um, and he's currently an advisor to Hillary Clinton's campaign. And next to him is Larry Korb, who is also an advisor to Bernie Sanders' campaign. He's a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and a senior advisor to the Center for Defense Information. And Larry also was Assistant Secretary of Defense. 
don't know. Manpower is pretty important. <laughs> Assistant Secretary for Defense for Manpower, Reserve Affairs, Installations, and Logistics from 1981 to 85 under then President Reagan. So in that job, he administered about 70% of the defense budget. So these two gentlemen have been around Washington a long time, and, uh, and they know a lot about every, every question we could pose to them. So I think it's going to be a lively debate. I want to just run through for you the rules of the debate. Each, uh, each side will be given a two-minute opening statement to start us off. Then I will go to questions. They will each have two minutes to answer a question. The other side will get one minute for a rebuttal. And counter rebuttals will depend on the situation if we want to still spend time on that. As for all of you, you're welcome and encouraged to ask your own questions. You have little note cards at your seat. You can write questions down and just hold up your hand and someone will come around and collect your question. And for those of you watching on the live stream, we also encourage you to send in your questions. And you can do that by tweeting at NIA Council. Um, you can also tweet to me if you want, at Indira underscore L. But the important thing is sending it to NIA Council and using the hashtag Dem Surrogates Debate. Um, so we look forward to hearing your questions. And I just want to mention that the organizers did contact every presidential campaign for every candidate who's still in the race and asked for surrogates to participate. And only the Clinton and Sanders campaigns um, sent surrogates. So that is why we're having a Democratic side debate. <laughs> All right. So I think we were flipping a coin for who was going to go first, Trita. Has that flip been done? Oh, you're so old school. Who has a coin, I Nancy? Don't, I, don't, I, don't carry, I don't carry coins anymore. Flipping that's a credit card, maybe? Do we, want it? We, can, <laughs> we can. All right. All right. Do you want to flip that? And who would like to call it? Uh, Derek, what would you like to be, heads or tails? Heads. Heads. All right. Can you flip it for us, please? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, well, yeah. Just make sure it rotates that adds in the some air, too. That color to our debate. We Okay. Who's calling? Derek oh, called heads, heads and heads. Larry tails. It's too messy to see. Jeez. <laughs> 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 no, it's a tail. It's a tail. Okay, Larry, you will be starting us off on behalf of Bernie Sanders. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Dyack and the School of Public Policy for doing this because I think it. Oh, that's right. All right. I'd like to thank uh, IAC and the School of Public Policy for doing this, Derek for coming, and, and you're for uh, uh, moderating the discussion. I'm going to tell you four things about uh, <clears throat> Senator Sanders and his uh, 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 foreign policy. The first is he's qualified. He's been in Congress for 25 years. He's seen the end of the Cold War, several military uh, uh, operations. Uh, <clears throat> and more qualified than many people who become president, like Bill Clinton, uh, who was a governor, Ronald Reagan, who I worked for, who was a, uh, who was a, a governor. Even Barack Obama was not in the Senate uh, that, uh, that, that long. So he is qualified for, for the job. Now, when people say, well, other people may be more qualified, you know who's the most qualified person ever to come into the national security arena? Dick Cheney. Because, and he didn't, that's the second thing, is uh, uh, Senator Sanders is well-informed, or the term that's been used, he has uh, judgment. Now, everybody talks about the vote to authorize the war in Iraq, but the key thing is, read what Senator Sanders said when he decided not to do it. You can tell he understood the issues, he understood what happens when you use a uh, um, uh, mil military, uh, military uh, uh, force. So he is uh, well informed and he is courageous. Basically, if you take a look at his speech that, Ni uh, that <clears throat> APAC wouldn't let him give remotely, he was the first candidate, they never let do that. But if you look at that when he talked about us having you know, a balanced policy toward the Middle East and not supporting everything that the uh, Netanyahu <clears throat> government does. And then uh, finally, his implementing policy is going to be very much like Obama's strategic patience. Military should be the last option. Uh, make sure that uh, you do it multilaterally if you can, unilaterally only if you must, and 
you also need to rebuild at home because you can't be strong in the world unless you rebuild at home. Okay, thank you. Derek. Okay, first to start with thank yous. Thank you, Indira, for, for moderating. Thank you, Marilyn, for hosting us. Thank you, Trita, for having us as well. I should also say, and this will cut against my time, I'm, I'm sure 25 years ago, I was a sophomore in college. I took American foreign policy with that guy, Shibley <laughs> Telhami. So it's a little, <laughs> so anything, a little unnerving to have my former professor right there in front of me. Anything I say that is somewhat off, blame him. That's who I learned it from. Uh, it's, th this is a hugely important election uh, for the American people and for the world. And Secretary Clinton has said there are three big questions that the next president has to answer. First, how are you going to keep the American people safe? Second, how are you going to break down barriers and make meaningful change for people at home and around the world? And third, how are you going to bring the American people together to bridge these divides that have been exposed in this election? And how are you going to bring the world together to try to find uh, or solve common problems? Now, it's very important to note that it's not enough just to diagnose the problems. You have to have experience and the, policy, the right policies to try to deal with these problems. And I think Secretary Clinton has proven over her long career in public service that she has both the experience and the right policies, starting with keeping the American people safe. Obviously, as a senator from New York, she helped New York City and New York State rebuild after the 9-11 attacks. As Secretary of State, uh, she worked tirelessly to protect the American people when it, tried, when it came to trying to solve uh, diplomatic problems around the world. And of course, she has a concrete plan to deal with terrorism, to deal with ISIS. We can get into that later. Secondly, breaking down barriers and, and, and bringing meaningful change to people. She's been breaking down barriers her entire career. Her election will break down a very big barrier in the United States of having the first woman president. And as a Secretary of State, she tried to break down barriers all over the world, whether it was empowering women and girls, or uh, dealing with, with those of other religions, trying to break down the barriers that she see, saw between the United States and Islam. And then third, bringing the American people together and bringing the world together. She has shown in the way she's conducted this campaign that she can unify the Democratic Party. I believe she can unify the people. And I believe as president, just as, as Secretary of State, she will be able to bring the world together to solve the toughest problems that we face. All right, thank you. All right, so we'll get into the, the heart of the questions now. Derek Shirley, I want to start with you. You mentioned experience and policy that Hillary Clinton has. Hillary Clinton has, of course, touted her experience as Secretary of State, while Bernie Sanders has stressed what he calls his better judgment. As a senator, Hillary Clinton, of course, voted for the Iraq War. As secretary, she was a vocal advocate of U.S. military intervention in Libya to oust Colonel Gaddafi, a decision that President Obama himself now says he regrets because he did not consider the day after in Libya where violent chaos continues five years later. So do Secretary's decisions in, do Secretary Clinton's decisions in Iraq and Libya lend credence to Sanders' argument that experience without good judgment is not enough? Well, first, it's important to note on, the Iraq, on Iraq, uh, she herself has said that that was a mistake, as did the many other uh, Democratic politicians and Democratic uh, policy officials like myself. Uh, secondly, on Libya, President Obama did not say that the intervention itself was he regretted. He said that the way that the aftermath was handled was a regret. Uh, I think if you look at the totality of Secretary Clinton's long public service, all of her efforts on behalf of the American people and people around the world to try to bring about positive change, to improve, improve people's lives, to bring about peaceful outcomes, to try to solve tough problems, she's shown time and again the good judgment to make things happen. Larry, would you like to respond? Let's take a look, uh, since you brought it up, the Iraq War. Not only did Secretary Clinton vote to go to war, she did not read the classified national intelligence estimate before she did. Now, I'm going to give away my age. The Gulf of Tonkin sent me to war, and people didn't know what was going on. So I swore from then on I would ensure that if we do it, we do it right. The, the NIE has been declassified, and we now know there was no case for war. Senator Bob Brain, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, told her to read it. She did not read it. To me, that is a dereliction of duty. Would you like to counter respond, Derek? Or you feel you already dealt Again, with it? Again, we we, this is the third presidential election in which we've litigated the 2002 Iraq war vote. Uh, Secretary of State Clinton was, ran for president in 2008, renouncing that vote. 
Uh, no, in 2008, she did not renounce that vote. She did Sorry, not. I, com I covered she, that camp she didn't I covered her she, well, campaign. Some, she, <laughs> she, only she, has, she, she only has renounced she, it during she this has, She has since said, long since said that she regretted that vote, right? That she would, of course, vote differently had she, could she do it all over yeah. again. Six years later, the, she had the not. The bottom line is she was Secretary of State for four years under President Obama, in which she worked very hard to try to manage a responsible withdrawal from Iraq. She tried very hard to ensure that as the military withdrew from Iraq, we were prepared, uh, diplomats and civilians prepared to backfill uh, the military presence that was going to be pulling out. So we just, we can't conduct ourselves as though the Obama administration didn't happen and she didn't serve as one of the most effective secretaries of state in history in that administration. All right. Uh, again, well, I, I would. Let's move on to the next oh, question excellent. since okay. you already addressed it. All right. <laughs> All right. So, Larry, um, Senator Sanders has touted his judgment, but he has very little experience in the arena of foreign policy, and we have yet to hear from him a detailed foreign policy agenda where he actually explains what he's going to do on certain important issues. He, we know, voted against the 1991 Gulf War, and he voted against the 2003 invasion of Iraq. But what is his specific plan for ending the Syrian civil war and fighting ISIS, other than building international coalitions, which is something that Secretary Clinton has far more experience doing? Well, first of all, what he has argued is, in Syria, we need to stay out of the civil war. We need to solve it so we can all focus on ISIS and we should get the countries in the region actually to do that because it's not just an American, uh, American uh, un under undertaking. And again, when you say, as I say, you mentioned all of the things that he was involved in, he voted. He was involved in those issues. And so you say he doesn't have. Now, we can get into the judgment about Libya. We can get into what Secretary Clinton recommended to stay in Iraq. I mean, there are a lot of things. Was she uh, an acceptable secretary? Right. But not as good as the ones I served with, for example, George Schultz and somebody you know because you've written about him, Jim Baker. She was not in that league. All right. Um, would you like to respond, Derek? Well, again, this is Secretary Clinton, over the course of this campaign, has given three major speeches about her policy proposals, very specifically on how she would address Syria, how she would address ISIS, the Iraq crisis, and counterterrorism generally. She's a believer that it's not enough just to say it's a problem, because those of us who've served in government understand that's what your life is about, is problems. It's about coming up with a pragmatic, practical solution to actually trying to, to address those problems. Uh, it's not to deny that they're tough. They're very tough. And I think she has, I know, she has put forth uh, some very thoughtful proposals on how to deal with those. Well, let's talk about those, Derek. President Obama has said <coughs> that he's proud of his decision not to launch airstrikes against Syria after Assad crossed his red line on chemical weapons. The president says he managed instead to broker the removal of most of Syria's chemical weapons and avoid dragging the U.S. into another Middle East war. Secretary Clinton has been quite critical of President Obama on Syria when even right after she was in the administration, she said that he waited too long to train and arm moderate Syrian rebels. So what would she do differently to end the war in Syria? And how would she prioritize removing Assad versus defeating ISIS and other extremist groups? Well, I, I think you're right. Secretary Clinton has noted that during her time in government service, there are times when she and President Obama had honest disagreements. Uh, and as she said in the last debate, she's able, she advocates, the president decides. Uh, so there are certain things she would have decided to have done differently, of course. But these add up to be largely tactical differences. This isn't differences of strategy. When it comes to the Syria campaign, she said the president basically has the right strategy. There are certain areas that she would accelerate or add more emphasis, more special operators on the ground, uh, perhaps exploring a no-fly zone, for example, in Syria. Uh, an intelligence surge. Now, I should note, a lot of those things are happening today. Just this week, Secretary Carter in Baghdad, Secretary of Defense Carter, announced another 200 uh, uh, U.S. soldiers are going to be going to Iraq to help the Iraqi security forces as they prepare to take Mosul. So I think she sees the general overall strategy as the right one. The question is the inputs that, is, uh, that we're putting into those, and there's some tweaks there. All right, Larry, um, he mentioned the no-fly zone. We know that your candidate, Senator Sanders, does not support a no-fly zone over Syria. Tell us why. Well, basically, as General Dempsey, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff until a year ago, 
uh, basically someone who was appointed by President Obama, said basically it would require a very large commitment of American troops. We couldn't control it. We wouldn't you know, know what, uh, what, what happened. And basically it would get us involved in the middle of the Syrian civil war, which the military does not want to do, nor do they want to get involved in Libya. So basically, that's why I think Senator Sanders is taking that position, because it gets us involved in another civil war. And we've seen Iraq and Libya, it doesn't turn out well. So specifically, what would he do better than what President Obama is doing Well, basically, now? I think he would support President Obama's strategy, OK? Basically, I, you want to call it strategic patience, or don't do stupid, you know what, uh, here. And, and basically, end the civil war, focus on ISIS, because Assad, as horrible as he is, we don't know what would come after him. So you got to work, as Secretary Kerry is, with the Russians and the other parties, stop the civil war, focus on ISIS. Derek, let me ask you to respond to that. I mean, on the one hand, um, your candidate, Secretary Clinton, did say in an interview shortly after she left the secretary job that don't do stupid stuff shouldn't be an organizing principle of a major country's foreign policy. She later apologized to President Obama for any offense from her having said that. But how could she avoid getting the US into another quagmire if she does pursue a no-fly zone, if she does arm and train more so-called moderate Syrian rebels who haven't necessarily been vetted, how does she avoid all the problems that her president now has really tried very hard to avoid? Well, she's very mindful of those problems, and that's why I think the broader strategy is one that she supports. We've been arming and training the Syrian opposition now for the better part of two years, and of course the Pentagon tried and failed to train a large number of the Syrian opposition uh, recently, and now they've scaled back that effort in trying to drain, uh, train smaller units. On this no-fly zone issue, we've been conducting airstrikes over Syria since September 2014. We, every day, U.S. pilots get in planes and bomb Syria. We've dropped about 5,000 airstrikes in Syria. So we have a de facto no-fly zone in, over large parts of Syria right now. So I think the proposal to try to ground the Syrian Air Force and work with the Russians and others to ensure that there aren't combat operations uh, throughout all of Syria is a sound one to, to attempt. We may not be able to do it, but I think she said there's merit in at least trying to get that done. All right, let me switch gears to Iran. Larry Korb, Senator Sanders supported the Iran nuclear deal, an agreement that has been criticized by really vociferous opponents in Congress who are convinced that Iran's regime will seek ways to weaken remaining sanctions and cheat on the deal. What will Senator Sanders do to ensure Iran's compliance with the deal and to confront legislative challenges in the U.S. to the agreement, such as new sanctions? Well, again, I think he would deal. do what President Obama has done. They've had these legislative challenges. They haven't gone <clears throat> uh, any place. And he has said that he will ensure that the deal is enforced. If it's not, then you get the international community to put, the, uh, put the sanctions on. But the key thing that <clears throat> Senator Sanders said that got a lot of a concern. He said he would move toward normalizing relations with Iran. And everybody said, oh, how can you do that? Wait a second. Richard Nixon went to China in 1972 when they were still sending equipment to kill Americans in Vietnam. And, and, and basically, they were in the throes of the Cultural Revolution. Franklin Roosevelt recognized the Soviet Union in the 30s. You've got to be able to bring nations in and deal with them. And if they basically you know, uh, uh, are willing to accept international norms, then you ought to normalize. But that should be our goal. All right. Derek, a question for you on Iran. Um, Iran has complained that international banks have refused transactions involving their country, even those that are permitted under the nuclear accord. The Obama administration has responded by enabling dollar transactions, a procedure that will go into effect tomorrow. That move has been condemned by opponents of the deal in Washington who say it's yet another giveaway to Iran that shows that the government in Tehran will continue to demand more concessions. How much should the United States be doing to make sure that Iran benefits from the deal, from complying with the deal, or should it just say straight up that the deal is not open for renegotiation? Well, the deal is not open to renegotiation, but Iran, to the extent they comply with the deal, they should get what is agreed to in the deal. And it, just take a big step back, though. This deal would not have happened if Hillary Clinton had not been Secretary of State. I mean, this was one of the biggest uh, diplomatic moves of the Obama administration that started 
really from day one of President Obama and Secretary Clinton taking office. The sanctions regime that pressured Iran to bring them to the table was pulled together by the Secretary of State. The initial dip diplomatic opening to Iran, the very kinds of, of brave conversations that Larry is talking about, the kinds of diplomacy that Henry Kissinger conducted with China, was conducted by Hillary Clinton's State Department uh, in 2011 and 2012. So that's why she believes very strongly that we need to implement this deal uh, uh, rigorously. And she's committed to doing that as, as the president. Larry Korb, does Secretary Clinton deserve credit for this deal having happened? You've painted her as a warmonger and someone who is really too quick on the trigger for intervention. Your candidate, Senator Sanders, is someone who's got much better judgment. But apparently, according to Derek Cholet, she was key in helping start the negotiations that eventually led to Yeah, the she was. But don't forget, in the 2008 campaign, when President Obama said he was going to reach out to Iran, North Korea, and Cuba, she, called, she criticized them for it. So I'm glad when she got in that she carried out his policy. And yes, she does deserve uh, you know, credit for beginning the talks. But I think the real credit goes to John Kerry for bringing them over the goal because they got close, but there was a whole bunch of issues that they had to work out in the end. All right. Well, Derek, to that point, Secretary Clinton has said in the past that she's proud Iran is her enemy. And she also said that the country does not have the right to enrich uranium. This was in 2014, so it was already more than six months <coughs> after the interim, um, you know, interim deal had been approved. Given that President Obama and Secretary Kerry were able to resolve the nuclear issue with Iran only after agreeing to Iranian enrichment, a limited enrichment program, and using more diplomatic language, what makes you think that Iran would be willing to continue the diplomatic process with the Hillary Clinton administration? I mean, I, I, she's been very clear that she supports this Iran deal. She gave a major speech last uh, summer or fall at Brookings talking about her support for the Iran deal and the ways that she will be committed to, to implementing it and enforcing it. Uh, she clarified, by the way, her remarks about Iran being an enemy. It's, it's Iranian government, really, uh, that she sees is proud that she's the enemy of. Uh, the Iranian people, of course, she's, she's worked very hard as Secretary of State and then as a candidate to talk about ways that we can continue to reach out to the Iranian people. I know that's something that's very important that vital organizations like this one uh, are part of. So I think she, she's got a lot of uh, credibility with the region, the Middle East. She's got, I think the Iranian government understands that she's a, a tough customer, and I think that they would be willing uh, to, uh, to deal with her when it comes to the implementation of this deal. Setting aside the implementation of the deal, what I really meant was the diplomatic process in general. Some people have seen the nuclear deal as one step towards an eventual rapprochement with Iran, and one that would allow U.S.-Iranian cooperation throughout the region on a number of different issues. There had been hopes that it would have helped them cooperate on Syria or on other things. Is that something where Secretary Clinton sees that despite the terrorism and human rights abuses and all the failings of the Iranian government, does she still see it as a government she could work with on issues other than the nuclear deal? I think President Obama has been very clear. The nuclear deal is only about Iran's nuclear aspirations. It doesn't address Iran's support for terrorism in the region. It doesn't address Iran's con con proliferation of conventional weaponry. It doesn't address all the other things we have problems with when it comes to the Iranian government's behavior and their efforts to destabilize the Middle East. That said, President Obama and I believe a President Clinton would also seek to pragmatically work with Iran in areas where we have overlapping interests. For example, Secretary Kerry, President Obama have worked with the Iranians when it have come to trying to bring about some sort of diplomatic solution in Syria where the Iranians are at the table with others. I, would, I wouldn't rule that out if, if Hillary Clinton were President. But it, it wouldn't be out of any uh, wild hope that, that anytime soon we're going to have a rapprochement with the Iranian government. I don't see that in the cards either from Tehran or from the United States. But there are areas, as the Bush administration actually first showed in Afghanistan and then in Iraq, and then of course as Obama has shown on the nuclear program and then on Syria, where it makes sense to perhaps sit down with the Iranians and, t and negotiate toughly with them. Larry Korb. Would Senator Sanders see this nuclear deal as the first step towards a I think so. In fact, he made it clear, and he's been harshly criticized for it. Does it mean you're not going to have some bumps along the road? But every time I think of this, I had the great fortune to spend one day with the late Itzhak Rabin. And I asked him 
during the day, I said, how can you negotiate with Arafat? You know, this is quite a while ago. He said, look, you got to negotiate with your enemies, your friends you just deal with. Yes, you have to negotiate and you have to, and you have to, have to do that. I think he would. He would be open to that just like President Obama was to Cuba. Okay, and he reached out. You may remember he reached out to Iran early on and they rebuffed him. But eventually, with Secretary Clinton's help, they were able to make something happen. But I think, yes, he would, because you've got, we have, you know, it's a, a, we have relations with countries like Russia. We got disagreements, but we got a lot of agreements. They helped us in the Iran deal, okay? They let our uh, equipment go through Russia to go to Afghanistan. And in the same way, Derek mentioned, you know, they can help us in Syria, they can help us in Yemen, okay, they help us in Iraq okay to deal with, uh, with these things. So I think you have to deal with them. Now that doesn't mean you ignore the other things that they do. But you know, in terms of countries that we ally with, I don't know if I would prefer to live in Iran as compared to some of our allies who President Clinton is meeting, I mean President Obama is meeting with this week. Okay, that's a pretty strong <laughs> statement, Derek Cholet. I think I'll let you respond to that. that uh, Larry Korb is saying on behalf of Senator Sanders that he might prefer living in Iran to, I think you're referring to Saudi Arabia. Yes, I, I don't think Secretary Clinton would concur with that. All right. I, I, I know President Obama would not concur with that. Well, all right, let's uh, dig in on the Saudi Arabia question, all right? Larry, in a recent interview, President Obama said that Saudi Arabia should get used to sharing the neighborhood with Iran. Um, since the execution of the Shia cleric Nimr al-Nimr by Saudi Arabia and the sacking of the Saudi embassy in Iran, hopes for any rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia have gone down the drain and Saudi Arabia has cut off formal relations. How will Senator Sanders work to manage the Saudi-Iranian rivalry amid all the ongoing conflicts? Well, in the region? I think he would basically, like President Obama did with the nuclear deal, get the parties together, or like Secretary Kerry has done, getting the people together in Geneva to talk about Syria to see if there is some common, uh, common ground between the two. Because they're both not going to go away. They're both very important. I mean, the Saudis have the third largest military budget in the world. The Iranians, by the way, are way down. They don't spend that much on defense. So I think he would work to do that. And that would be really help the stability in the region because, again, without going into the, you know, the history and the Sykes-Picot agreement and all of the Sunni Shias, they're the two symbols of you know, the Sunni and the Shias. And if they can talk to each other, that will go over so well with the rest of the people in that region. Derek Shirley, I see you nodding your head in seeming agreement. Do you agree, would your candidate agree that the two countries should each have a zone of influence no. in the Middle East? Or given our many differences with both Iran and Saudi Arabia, is it on the face unwise for the U.S. to outsource stability in the Middle East to two regional <coughs> powers rather than taking care of it ourselves? Well, absolutely not. This isn't about outsourcing stability. This is not about creating zones of influence. Trying to seek some sort of... Uh, uh, agreement where they, there's a coexistence, uh, I think, is in everyone's interest. Of course, the Gulf allies, Saudi Arabia, uh, countries like UAE, deal with the Iranians a lot more than the United States does. Uh, and it's, they have diplomatic relations back and forth. We don't. Um, our Gulf allies are critical partners of the United States. They're critical military partners. Uh, obviously, economically, we rely on one another. Uh, the, that's why President Obama is, was in Riyadh today, uh, and that's why Secretary Clinton is committed on building on, on these efforts to strengthen the U.S.-GCC partnership. Uh, that said, when we look at the region as a whole, it's very important that we don't uh, accentuate the Sunni-Shia divide. Uh, clearly, uh, Iran is going to play a role in Iraq in the future. It does today. We want to ensure that that role is a positive one. Uh, we're not denying that Iran has, has an interest in Iraq. We just have a, have a very strong in interest in ensuring that what Iran is doing in Iraq is not breaking that country apart, not exporting terrorism. Uh, and I think that's what Secretary Clinton will work very hard with our, our Gulf partners and our Israeli allies uh, to, to get done. Well, Derek, let me ask you a little bit deeper about the question Larry referred to it. Um, of you know concerns that Senator Sanders has about our alliance 
with Saudi Arabia. In less than a year, the U.S. has provided more than $33 billion of weaponry to the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. The bulk of that went to Saudi Arabia. The U.S. has also given logistical support to the Royal Saudi Air Force, despite misgivings of some officials in the U.S. government, some of your own former colleagues, as it prosecutes a bombing campaign against Houthi rebels in Yemen, in which an estimated 3,200 civilians have died. Have Saudi Arabia's military operations in Yemen hurt U.S. interests or our values on human rights and the protection of civilians? And how would Secretary Clinton approach our alliance and our military cooperation with Saudi Arabia overall? Well, she believes in a strong U.S.-Saudi partnership. Saudi uh, is not an uncomplicated ally. Uh, Secretary Clinton has been very clear about this uh, in her speeches, public statements. Uh, there's too many uh, folks in Saudi Arabia, some of the Saudi government, who continue to uh, support financially extremists. Um, but I think you know, part, this gets to the experience issue, which I think is, is important. Secretary Clinton has a lot of experience dealing with uh, the Saudi government, uh, with our Gulf allies. She's well known in the region. She's trusted in the region. Uh, she's been there for the highs and been there for the lows. Uh, this will be someone who on day one when they take office is going to be ready to deal with the roiling currents of that region, which are not going to abate anytime soon. And whereas we will, we support the Saudis militarily clearly, but uh, we may have differences with them over how they're persecuting their campaign in Yemen. And we're, we're of course learning a lot about some of their capability gaps in Yemen, which is leading to some of the civilian casualties. Uh, I think that's, she's, in a, she's in the best position of any candidate, Republican or Democrat, to deal constructively uh, with the le leadership in Riyadh, which itself is going through a pretty dramatic change right now. Larry Korb, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, on behalf I mean, of it's Senator very Sanders. interesting. I don't know if you've been following this, but the 9-11 Commission had some information there about the Saudis' role in that. Senator Sanders voted to release that part of it, and I think that's important. I, I think we have to be very... We do, we depended on the Saudis because we needed them from oil. President Roosevelt stopped them way back in Tehran in World War II. When I was in government, we got the Saudis to pump oil so the Soviet economy you know, would, uh, would collapse. We're not that dependent on them anymore. So I think we can and should be more, uh, I, I think, uh, um, unbiased when we deal with them. Let me, if I can tell a little anecdote. Uh, you all know that when we, after we overthrew the government in Afghanistan, Lakhtar Brahimi set up the Karzai government. Well, things weren't going too well in Afghanistan in 2011, so put together a task force, and I was on it. We were over there. One night we met with the former number two in the Taliban. And I said, well, if you come back into power and you control parts of Afghanistan, how will you treat women? Remember how big a thing Bush made it? You know what he said to me? We won't be any worse than the Saudis. I mean, you know, they do beheadings, and, and, and so this idea that somehow we don't need them that much anymore, okay? And these weapons, they're buying them from us since they got a lot of money, all right? So I think we got to tell them, look, guys, you got to shape up if you want to be with us. Beheadings? They beheaded 95 people yet last year. And, and this is, you know, you go around the world, people say, you're claiming you have these values and you stand for this? Look what you do. So I think we've got to level with them and let them know that their behavior you know, uh, it has to conform to what we want or we're not going to be, have the same relationship. Derek, I'd like you to respond to that because Secretary Clinton has not only a lifelong history of advocating for human rights in general, so the beheadings would be something I believe she would be against, um, but also against, I mean, she's, she's advocated in favor of women's rights, going so far as going to Beijing and declaring women's rights or human rights. So how does she square that? with dealing with a government like Saudi Arabia that is, um, has such an unequal approach to women. And also, please address the question of whether a Secretary Clinton administration would release the 28 classified pages about Saudi Arabia's role in 9-11. I, I actually don't know the question, the answer to that latter question. I know President Obama has said he'd release it. I think Secretary Clinton has said that she would. but. I but it hasn't happened now ahead of his yeah. trip to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it hasn't, it, but yeah, I think the president said... Well, when would. you become our Secretary yeah, of State, you, you can <laughs> get her. <laughs> would. Uh, I, I advocated for that 10 years ago. Um, but look, I th Secretary Clinton uh, has been to Saudi Arabia many times. She's dealt with several kings, and in all of those meetings, she brings up 
subjects like women and girls. I mean, this is clearly something that uh, she believes very passionate about. Uh, now, do we hold our entire relationship to Saudi Arabia hostage over, over that issue? Clearly, there's many things at stake here. But the important thing for Secretary Clinton, when it comes to all of our relationships around the world, whether with countries that are our allies or countries that are not our allies, mm -hmm. uh, is to make sure that those issues remain front and center, a priority of hers as Secretary of State, a priority of hers as President, and that over time, uh, we will see those changes. But clearly, I mean, the absolute agreement that, that these, the behavior in Saudi Arabia, beheadings, the treatment of women and girls is abhorrent and uh, is unacceptable. All right, Larry Korb, I want to switch to national security overall. Um, Senator Sanders has pledged to shut down Guantanamo. Given eight years of stalled efforts by President Obama to accomplish what he promised to do on day one of his administration, he faced all sorts of opposition in the U.S. to setting the de detainees free or keeping them in U.S. prisons. There's been huge difficulty in getting other nations to agree to take them. What could your candidate possibly do differently well, that President I, Obama I think it's important done? when you look at Guantanamo, President Obama can't even get support from some of the people he appointed. And I think he put in too many people from the Democratic establishment. And I know for a fact that there are people in the Pentagon who are resisting what he wants to do. So I think what he would do is make sure he got his people in there to, to not put, uh, put roadblocks uh, uh, in there. The other thing I think, and I hope President Obama does it before he left office, find an executive order, do it, and let's see what happens, okay? You know, hopefully by then we'll have a, a, a liberal majority on the Supreme Court. But yes, he tried and it didn't work, and people came up with all these crazy ideas about, oh my goodness, if you put him in a top security prison in Colorado or South Carolina, it's going to endanger the thing. No, I, I think that he would move you know, forcefully and make sure that the people he appoints support that so that they will not throw up roadblocks. Derek Cholet, Secretary Clinton has also said that she um, supports the closure of Guantanamo. Again, what wisdom does she have that President Obama does not? How would she be able to negotiate its closure if he hasn't gotten it done? We may get there by the end of the year. There's about 80 left uh, with this last uh, batch of detainees. detainees who went to Saudi Arabia uh, last week or the week before. Um, this is something that Secretary Clinton worked on uh, quite a bit when she was Secretary of State. It's a very difficult troubling issue. It's one where there has been zero support from the United States Congress. In fact, opposite than support. There's been legislation to uh, stop the president from moving detainees, stop the president from closing Gitmo. I think this is one area which is important to note for the audience. We're talking a lot tonight about differences between Hillary Clinton and, and Bernie Sanders, and, and those differences are important. But let's just remember what this election's about. Because if a Republican wins in November, the issue is not are we closing Gitmo. The issue is we're keeping it open, and we are adding detainees to Gitmo. That's why it's so important that a Democrat wins this election. That's why we have to be very careful on how, who we choose as the Democratic nominee, because these are very you know, important debates and discussions and differences between uh, Clinton and Sanders, but they pale in comparison between Senator Sanders and Secretary Clinton and any of the Republican candidates for president. All right. Um, Derek. This is something that both of you dealt with when you were Assistant Secretary of Defense. It's the military footprint of the United States around the world. President Obama has scaled back the U.S. military footprint from the Bush years, but he has dramatically escalated America's covert operations, including prominently drone strikes. Would Secretary Clinton continue the President's so-called targeted killing policy, including we've talked about before signature strikes where you don't even know who the person is who you're hitting, um, would she wind them down? Would she expand them? And does she believe that these kinds of strikes create more extremism than they destroy? Uh, well, first, just on the premise of your question to take issue, Obama actually has not reduced the footprint significantly. What's changed is we're not at war in Iraq anymore. So that's a pretty big piece of the foot that is, that is, diff that is deployed differently. But of course, we're, we have more force in Asia, we have, uh, uh, we're getting, we're tripling the budget right now for Europe, and we have more f military deployed in the, in the Middle East right now than before 9-11. Uh, that said, on drones, Secretary Clinton's made clear it is an important military tool. It's one that 
we need to be very judicious in how we use, as President Obama has tried to be. We need to be increasingly transparent in, in how drones are used and the decision making uh, behind uh, using those drones and ensuring that we are hitting the right targets and using them in a way that the American people and that uh, the Congress can support. President Obama has made some very significant steps in that direction uh, with a speech he gave several years ago at, at the National Defense University with an unclassified uh, uh, memo about the decision-making process to go into drone strikes. So I think Secretary Clinton's made clear that she is prepared to continue those. It's a vital tool to fight terrorism, but it's one that in order to be sustained over time and continue to have the support of the American people and indeed the world, we need to be more transparent in how we use it. Larry, lay out for us Senator Sanders' yeah, position. Yeah, <coughs> Senator strikes. Sanders has been very clear. He would use them, but he would be very careful about civilian casualties and he would not do these signature strikes, <coughs> which I think <coughs> is the key thing. Those of you that are not into this business, it means you don't have a, a specific, uh, specific individual because, as he's pointed out, and even Don Rumsfeld pointed out when he was in there, you might kill one terrorist, but you create seven or eight more. All right, one thing that Sanders agrees with Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we, we found the one wow. thing right here, everybody. <laughs> Tweet it out. Okay. Uh, Derek Cholet, Senator Sanders has argued that Secretary Clinton's speech to APAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, gave a contrary message to her answers about Israel and the Palestinians from the New York debate last week. What type of pressures would Hillary Clinton as <coughs> president be willing to put on Israel um, and the Palestinians in order to address a peace process that hasn't budged since her husband's administration? Well, as Secretary of State, she worked tirelessly to try to bring about a peace negotiation between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I believe the last time that Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, uh, the Palestinian leader Abbas met face to face was with Secretary Clinton at the State Department. Um, of course, unfortunately, her efforts, subsequent efforts by Secretary Kerry, uh, by others have not led to any sort of peace negotiation. I think as president, though, she from day one will be committed to try to work to bring about a peace agreement between the Israeli and the Palestinian. She believes in a two-state solution. She does not believe in a one-state solution. She believes that the Israelis deserve to live uh, in security, but also that the Palestinians have the right to their own state. So I think this is, again, an issue she's got a lot of experience in. It's a very difficult issue. The United States, is, as Jim Baker used to say, the United States cannot want peace more than the parties themselves. Uh, but there's a lot that the United States can do uh, to try to bring peace about. I think she's deeply committed to doing that. All right. And Larry, tell us what Senator Sanders would do differently. Yeah. To bring about and I a think solution. it's very important. Uh, if you compare what Secretary Clinton did when she was Secretary of State, the speech she gave to AIPAC, and the one she gave as a candidate, they're not even close in terms, because when she was Secretary of State, she said many of the things that Senator Sanders has said. So when she went there, she, and she said one of the first things she would do when she got in office is invite uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu over after, you know, how he dissed President Obama and, you know, went to the, the, the Congress. So I'm, I'm sure she has experience, but I think what Senator Sanders has done is he has laid the groundwork to be an effective negotiator because as Roger Cohen, the columnist from the New York Times, has you know, pointed out, you know, this is heresy in the American political system to say this in a campaign. So I think he would be much more effective because the Palestinian would say, there's somebody who stuck up for us when it wasn't easy to do. All right, let's pivot to Russia now. Um, Larry, Senator Sanders has said that he supports US and EU sanctions against Russia for its intervention in Ukraine but he's cautioned against the use of military force. But I'm struck that back in 1997, Sanders opposed the expansion of NATO to include Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, many countries that we now consider to be protected by the NATO umbrella. He still opposes NATO expansion. So what is his plan for dealing with a country that Mitt Romney might have been right about? All right. Uh, and, and Sarah Palin too. <laughs> I think it's important to talk about NATO expansion. Those of you that study, George Kennan, the father of containment, said, if you do that, you're going to provoke conflict with Russia, okay? 
And, you know, we expanded it anyway with no thought. I can remember testifying against it with Bob Zellick, who went on to work for uh, President, uh, President Bush, and this is during the Clinton years. And particularly when you went into the Baltic states. Now, one of the toughest things to do when you're in policy is to put yourself in the other people's shoes. And if you talk to the Russians, they'll say, you know, how would you like it if we went to Canada, you know, and, uh, and, and, and Mexico? What he has said is, okay, you, it's expanded, it's a, it's a fait accompli, but economic is the way to put the pressure on Russia. Remember, we won the Cold War, not militarily, we won it economically, because going back to President Eisenhower, we made sure that we didn't put so much money into the military, we couldn't take care of our needs at home. And I think that's what, uh, you know, Senator said, keep the economic pressure on it. If the Russians have had to cut their military spending. They're now below the Saudis. Uh, they have economic problems at home with the low price of, uh, price of oil and, and uh, the, the sanctions on there. Now, temporarily, the Russian people are happy because, oh, they're, you know, we're, we're back in the game again and all that. But eventually, as we saw with the Soviet Union, when people can't get enough to eat and the life expectancy keeps going down, I think we will prevail uh, without using military force. So Derek, tell us what has Hillary Clinton learned in the four years that she had to deal with President Putin and Foreign Minister Lavrov, who constantly talked down to her and to the United States? Um, what has she learned about dealing with a resurgent Putin who has not bent to the will of the United States and has not cooperated on things we thought he would other than the Iran deal. He has continued to defy us, for example, in Syria and sort of ruled the day with his own military intervention the way he wanted it. What would she well, do differently? I mean, first, just on this NATO enlargement point, Secretary Clinton had supported NATO enlargement. Uh, then she supports it now. She said at the Chicago NATO summit, the next summit should be a, an enlargement summit. In fact, this upcoming summit in Warsaw, we will be lending, or we will be, NATO will be announcing that Montenegro will be coming in. Uh, and I think uh, when I travel to Poland or Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania today and I look at how the, far those countries have come, I say thank goodness that those countries are in NATO, uh, particularly when you look at what Russia is up to inside those countries uh, right now. Secretary Clinton, long experience dealing with Russians, with, the, with Putin, with Lavrov, with Medvedev before uh, Putin. You got to be tough. Uh, you've got to uh, be very firm. Uh, you can't trust them. Um, I think that uh, she would approach Russia with the same kind of tough pragmatism and the transactional uh, approach that was what the reset was all about. And in fact, that was not about giving things to Russia. That was about sitting down and talking, talking pragmatically with Russia about areas where we needed to work together that was in our interest, whether that was reducing the number of nuclear weapons with the New START Treaty, whether that was getting a supply line to our troops in Afghanistan with the Northern Distribution Network, or whether that was getting Russia's support for the Iran sanctions, which helped bring about the diplomatic uh, agreement on its nuclear program. I'd say, I'd say one thing. <clears throat> Basically, when President Bush said he was going to take Georgia and Ukraine into NATO, and it was during the Bush administration, Putin went into uh, Georgia. Those are, if you talk to the Russian people, they think that that's as much part of them as, you know, uh, uh, the District of Columbia is part of the United States. So, I mean, this whole idea that you can just keep it, NATO is a military alliance set up to deal with the threats from the Soviet Union. It went away. Now, basically, should we have incorporated all of the, 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 the countries into the European Union? Yeah, I think we should have done that. But this was a military alliance. And, you know, if you, if you were in Russia, as I was, you know, back in uh, 92, and they were looking at this. Now, you know this. In fact, I was going to bring this up. You wrote Baker's biography. They claim Baker let them know that if they unified Germany, they wouldn't do it. I don't know if that's true, but that was their perception. Just very quickly, um, I don't think Russia behaves because of necessarily only what we do. They've got their own interests at stake, uh, number one. Number two, uh, we've talked a lot about allies and alliances and the importance of bringing the world together in the course of this campaign on both sides of, of the aisle. Nothing would plunge the U.S.-European relationship into greater crisis than if we were to throw our new NATO allies under the bus to try to satisfy Vladimir Putin. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. I'm, they're already there, but you asked about what Sanders was opposed to it. <laughs> All right. Um, we've also invited the audience, both here, the live audience, and the audience watching live on the, on the stream, um, to suggest their own questions. So I'm going to start taking a few of those. One person has asked, a difference between Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders has been the use of coercive diplomacy, in this questioner's words. Secretary Clinton has frequently praised sanctions in combination with engagement as bringing Iran to the negotiating table. Given the struggles with Russia in Ukraine and Syria and the continued criticism of the Obama administration's failure to strike against Bashar al-Assad, what about the use of coercive diplomacy? How do you see that, Derek Cholet? Is that something that actually works? I think so. I think there's, there's no doubt the record shows that with Secretary Clinton's uh, efforts in, uh, with Iran, with bringing about an unprecedented sanctions regime against the, the uh, Iranian government in 2010, 2011, helped create <coughs> opening for diplomacy. I and think the questioner is saying, though, it worked with Iran and the nuclear deal, but it hasn't worked with Russia following their invasion of Ukraine, their annexation of Crimea. It hasn't worked with Syria, where there are also well, sanctions. I guess I, it depends on what you define by work. I mean, again, in, in the Syria, this is Secretary Clinton was not Secretary of State at the time, but during the Red Line episode, Obama ended up achieving what he wanted to achieve, which is getting all the chemical weapons out of Syria, which made us all safer. Uh, I would argue with Ukraine, Russia has been very damaged by its behavior in Ukraine. It's, it's not just US uh, angry with it and imposing sanctions, but more importantly, Europeans are the ones uh, imposing sanctions. And those sanctions are having a real bite on the Russian economy. Now, has that meant that Russia has just capitulated and, and stopped everything? A absolutely not. But I believe that over time, this is the kind of approach that could bring about a change of behavior in Russia. But I think everyone around the world, United States, Europe, uh, has, has not under any illusions about Vladimir Putin and uh, the limits of what we can do to actually influence his behavior. All right. Larry, I'd like you to address whether Senator Sanders thinks that coercive diplomacy, namely the use of economic sanctions and other forms of coercion, is effective. And I'm going to combine it with another question here where um, another person is asking, if we use foreign policy that forces nations to comply with our values, does that create a sustainable long-term partnership? OK. <clears throat> Let me take the second one first of all. Well, you can't force them, but you can make things that they want you to do contingent on them, you know, uh, embracing human values, I, 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 would, uh, I would put it uh, that way. I mean, for, as I mentioned before, with the Saudis who we were talking about, we're no longer as dependent on them for oil as we once were. So it becomes easier for us, I think, to get them to modify uh, their, uh, uh, their, their behavior. But, you know, we are, you know, I think Secretary Clinton uses this term, the indispensable nation. And, and, and we are because of who we, what we stand for. When we compromise those things, that undermines what Secretary Clinton called our smart power and our ability to get people to, uh, uh, you know, to do things. Now, going back to the first, the first part of the, the question in terms of that's exactly what he has said with Russia, you make them pay an economic price for what they're doing. And at some point, they're going to recognize that it's a losing game for them. And I agree with uh, President Obama, and I think Secretary Sanders does too. OK, they went into Syria. Good. Now you've got responsibility for it. How much are you willing to pay? And how long are you? You know, when they went into Ukraine, they claimed there were no Russian troops. But there were body bags going back. And the family said, what do you mean? No, you know what I mean? So in this day and age, with the, you know, the social media and stuff, you can't keep that stuff secret. OK. Um, we have another question here from the audience about the pivot to Asia, which was supposed to be a central piece of Obama's foreign policy. Um, obviously, Derek, Secretary Clinton, worked hard on this. She was in her very first trip, which I went on as Secretary of State, she went to four different cities the first in Asia. Dean Rusk to have their first trip to Asia. <laughs> That's right. So she had her first trip to Asia. She tried to pivot. She wrote that influential article in Foreign Affairs about the importance of the pivot. 
So how do you justify her opposition now to the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, given that it would be essential to mm -hmm. pivot to Asia mm -hmm. to be part of the TPP? Mm -hmm. Well, she still believes in the TPP. Of course, she helped launch the negotiations to, to uh, try to put together the TPP. She just believes that the, the deal that was the fine print was uh, developed after she left office is not a particularly good one. She's one, as she said, a, a gold standard trade agreement, uh, one that creates jobs, one that raises wages, uh, one that advances our national security. And she, once she had an opportunity to see the details of the TPP that was negotiated after she left, she believed it didn't meet that gold standard. So we can wait. This isn't like the Iran deal where the sanctions regime in Iran could, would have fallen apart had we pulled back from diplomacy. We can pause and we can try to renegotiate, and that's what she has said she would do. But fully supporting the idea of having the TPP and believing in its centrality to our overall approach to Asia. She just believes the specifics could be better. All right. Larry, I have to ask you, your candidate has opposed international trade treaties in general and trade with China in particular because he said that it has caused job losses in the United States and the weakening of labor unions. He said, I voted against permanent normal trade relations with China. That was the right vote. And if elected president, I will radically transform trade policies. How can he justify that in 2016, which is very different from the last century? It is a globalized economy, like it or not. How can the United States pull itself back into the past? Well, <clears throat> I think he's made it clear. And you know, he's talked about 10 deals that they've had. Secretary Clinton voted for eight of the trade deals, okay, he voted against all of them, that in fact we haven't focused enough on the American worker and how we will ensure that, you know, if, if you're working, you know, in the United States and somebody competing for you is making 20 cents an hour, how, how is that going to be? So you should put that into the uh, agreement. And I assume that's what Secretary Clinton's trying to do in the TPP. Okay, to make sure that we don't get the short end here in these, uh, in, the, in these deals. And, you know, our country is so wealthy, I think a lot of people negotiated and didn't focus enough. But as Senator Sanders has pointed out, yeah, the rich are getting richer, but the rest of us aren't. And so I think we need to be more concerned about, uh, about that right now. All right. We have a question from someone here in the audience at University of Maryland, and I'd also like to combine it with a question we got um, from one of the people watching on the live stream, um, who says, and it's directed at you, Derek Cholet, it says, um, what is wrong, Secretary Clinton, with having a goal of normalizing relations with Iran? And there's a related question from the audience here, um, what do you think about building bridges to so-called moderates in the Iranian government? Well, I, I think if we were to see a change in the Iranian government, if we were to see uh, an Iranian government that would allow basic freedoms, an Iranian government that uh, doesn't suppress uh, dissent, uh, sure, then a lot of things are possible. But we don't see any indication that the Iranian government is, is changing its brutal ways, whether that's uh, the way it treats its citizens at home or the way it, or it proliferates instability in the region. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, as a theoretical nation, a notion, sure. But this is not, a, uh, in terms of a practical agenda of what a president, uh, when they take office next year, will, will try to implement, it's nothing that's even close to beyond the horizon, absent some change in, in Tehran. Larry? Well, I think if you would apply those same criteria, would not, we not have, would not have recognized China. And I think in the long term, that's been good to get them into the, uh, into the world, uh, world Trade Organization. Despite your opposition to trade deals with China or Well, that's a different, different, different issue, okay? Uh, but what I'm talking about here is, you asked about Iran, that was the, the thing. Are they going to be perfect? No. But are they moving in the right direction? And if you open relations with them, what will happen? What happened after we opened relations with China? I mean, I can't believe it. In 1984, President Reagan sent me there to help modernize their military because we wanted them to fight the, uh, so be able to fight the Soviet Union. I went ba I've been back there several times. The last time I went back, uh, was uh, last year, actually to talk about the pivot to the Pacific, but, uh, uh, but 
basically, it's so much different. I mean, it is so much different. Is it perfect? No, but it's much better than it was under Mao. And I think that's what you, if you open it up. And here's another thing that I see important. I don't know if you saw it when you traveled around the world, but what happens is governments can blame the United States. Oh, things aren't going well in Iran it's because of this or that. Well, if we have normal relations, who are they going to blame? And, and I think that's the, the, the key thing. I mean, for example, you know, Putin is blaming us for a lot of things, you know, uh, getting out of the ABM treaty and not ratifying the comprehensive test ban treaty and all these other things. Okay, let's ratify them. Then what are you going to say? <laughs> See, you can't blame us because your problems are self-inflicted. They're really not caused by us. Well, you make the point that once you normalize relations with an adversarial nation, that they can't blame the United States anymore um, for policies. But in fact, I lived in China for seven years, and the Chinese government blames the United States for policies every single day, regardless of having normalized relations. But I was struck by something you said in your response. You referred to, you compared normalizing relations with Iran to normalizing relations with China and said it was a good thing for China to enter the WTO. Um, and yet that seems to go against Senator Sanders' opposition to trade in general. He was, in fact, the only member of the Senate's Democratic caucus to vote against renewing the Export-Import Bank's charter. So again, how do you justify at a time when trade, honestly, has globalized the economy? I think that ship has sailed. How do you justify um, what critics have said is basically sticking his head in the sand over well, global again, trade trying back, to deny I, it. On the Export-Import Bank, uh, I have a son-in-law who flies for Delta. He, D Delta Airlines was completely against it because it felt it gave an unfair advantage to other companies in the United States and stopped, you know, uh, uh, free trade. So the idea that, you know, you should be for it, is it helping the United States or hurting? There was a lot of debate about whether, in fact, you know, it was. But as I say, I remember the, you know, Delta you know, came out, you know, against it. So it's not like he's some Neanderthal here. I mean, you've got one of the biggest airlines in the world saying it is not good for business in the United States. Okay. We're going to take another question from one of our viewers who's tweeted us to ask Derek Cholet, does Secretary Clinton support Senator Chris Murphy and Senator Rand Paul's call for new conditions on U.S. military support for Saudi Arabia? I don't know. Okay. What would be your thought? Uh, as, I'd have to see what those conditions are. I mean, I'd okay. have to see. I mean, we don't give them everything they want. Uh, I used to, used to handle the Saudi account at the Pentagon, and there's a lot the Saudis are interested in. Uh, that, that we don't give them for a whole variety of reasons. So I would, I would have to take a look at that uh, more closely to advise her on what I would say. Okay, fair enough. Larry, are you familiar with yeah, that? I am, and I think side? Senator Sanders would support it. Again, because as he's talked about, the concern about what the Saudis do and how they get away with things. Remember, you know, we got Chris Murphy and Rand Paul, you know, different parts of the ideological spectrum. And they're the same group that's supporting, you know, get them to release the 28 pages. Uh, of, you know, the 9-11 uh, report. All right. Another question from Twitter um, for Derek Cholet, asking, what would Israel have to do to earn more criticism from Secretary Clinton? <laughs> Secretary Clinton's been, she's, she's pretty, can be, she can be pretty tough with, with the Israelis. I've, I was in the room with her, uh, when she could, she could Tell have us about pretty that. blunt conversations with, with <laughs> Israeli leaders, but we do it as friends. Uh, we do it as allies. Um, Tell us about some of the blunt uh, things that she said. And <laughs> I think that she would, you know, when she disagrees with certain decisions made by the government, she's very clear about those disagreements. But it's within the context of a many decade long partnership and friendship. Um, so I think she's, she's shown time and again in, during her time in public life, whether as a, as a first lady or whether as a senator or as a secretary of state, that she is willing to tell it like it is and stand up publicly when necessary, privately when necessary, and send a very clear message uh, to allied and adversary alike. Yeah, but she didn't criticize them when they came out against the Iran deal. And I'd be interested to see what she has to say about Netanyahu saying the Golan Heights are part of, uh, uh, of Israel. 
Well, it's interesting because on a trip um, with her as secretary to Israel, she stood next to Netanyahu and criticized him on settlements. This was early during the Obama administration. And despite that public rebuke that she made to Netanyahu, it didn't stop the settlements. In fact, they increased, and the Obama administration, eventually the president himself, reversed himself on that position. So what would Senator Sanders be able to do differently that would be more effective than this president has been well, able to I, do? I think and the key thing is getting the parties back to talk, because we all know what the end game should be, the two-state solution with the 67 borders you know, with the adjusted for land swaps. As I said before, I think he has the credibility because I have no doubt that in, you know, a private secretary Clinton may have been tough with Netanyahu, but the fact that he's done it much more than any candidate that I can remember publicly are going to get uh, people in the, in the Middle East, the, in particular the Palestinians, to feel he is a, you know, neutral arbitrator. Okay. Another question from our audience here. Republican frontrunner Donald Trump has suggested that U.S treaty allies, Japan and South Korea, should do more to bear the burden of their own defense. How do your candidates see the current arrangement and what steps would they take to rectify the imbalance if they see such an imbalance? Both of you having been assistant secretaries of debate of defense, I think, can, <laughs> and of debate, can certainly handle that. Derek, I'll give it to you well, first. I, first of all, I think it wouldn't surprise anyone to hear me say this, but I think uh, Donald Trump uh, spending a lot of time belittling some of our closest partners, and that's not just not productive or smart, it's wrong. Uh, South Korea, Japan, many of other, mo all of our other treaty allies do a lot for their own defense. Uh, our presence in their countries is absolutely vital to their security, it's vital to our own security. Uh, we've worked very hard over many years in this administration and previous administrations to work with those countries as they seek to modernize uh, change their budget, spend more of their own money on their own defense. But we have an interest in being there as well. So uh, there certainly are things that one would change. We constantly have discussions with both our Japanese and Korean friends on, on uh, base issues, for example, which can be very sensitive uh, in those countries. Uh, the size of our military footprint, the kinds of operations that we conduct, the kind of exercises and training that we do together. And of course, we're interested in them doing more. But we're very satisfied with those relationships. They're very strong relationships. They're good relationships, relationships for the American people and for the region. And again, this is an area where Secretary Clinton, uh, having traveled with her to those countries, she's got a lot of experience dealing with those leaders, dealing with those sometimes tricky issues. And as president, we're prepared from day one to deal with those. All right, Larry, what about Senator Sanders? Well, again, I think he has pointed out that we're carrying too much of the burden. Now, he's not going to be like Donald Trump and tell South Korea and Japan, get your own nuclear weapons or anything like that. But it is important. If President Obama, in the interview he gave to Jeff Goldberg in The Atlantic, was very complaining about what he called the free riders, uh, and people do. I mean, if Europe is so concerned about Putin, why don't they meet their NATO target of 2% of GDP? Well, maybe they're getting a little closer now. But the fact of the matter is the American people say, wait a second, okay? It's more in, more in, you're more threatened than we are, so why, do, you know, why can't you guys uh, you know, uh, s step up? I mean, our defense budget, even after sequestration, is higher than it was in real dollars than at the height of the Cold War. I mean, so this idea that somehow you know, we should do this when we got other needs at home, I think, is, is basically what the American people and Senator Sanders are saying, talking about rebuilding you know, at, uh, at home. So I do think that Donald Trump has touched a nerve here. Now, his comments are just off the wall and some of the things that he said. But NATO hasn't agreed 2% of GDP. How many of the 28 nations? Four. <clears throat> what about the other 24? Why aren't they doing it? Well, if you got the United States is here, they'll do it, OK? We did, Derek mentioned it earlier. We just have the European Resource Initiative. We put five, we're going to rotate 5,000 troops and equipment in there. 400% increase in the budget for that? Wow, what are the other people doing? And so I think that's really the key, uh, you know, the key issue. Again, just if I could on this, totally agree. I mean, diagnosing the problem, we can agree. Secretaries of Defense, going back at least to Rumsfeld, if not before, have gone <laughs> to Europe and given basically the same speech. I know because I at least wrote yeah. for two secretaries <laughs> of Defense the same speech, right. which was Europe needs to spend more on its defense. The question is, how are you going to get it done? 
how are you going, the president's going to need to go over, send this message, persuade allies to make these tough decisions in their own budgets, to spend money on defense, and to spend it cor correctly, to spend it in the modernizing, we modernizing weapons that they actually need. How you do that, it's going to take experience, it's going to take a lot of diplomatic skill, and again, that's something that Secretary Clinton has in spades. All right, well, you've talked about NATO and the responsibilities there and how those should be shared. Um, President Obama is actually going to be in Germany this week supporting the TTIP. Mm -hmm. So what is Secretary Clinton's position on a U.S.-EU trade deal? That's a question that came in to us from Twitter. So she's for it, but TTIP's not done. So this is, this is kind of like what TPP was like several years ago, where, of course, this was an initiative of the Obama administration. Uh, uh, for the last several years, we've talked about the importance of having a trade deal with Europe, but the details are to follow, and that's what's being worked out right now, so I think she would reserve judgment to see those details. A lot of sensitivities on the European side of this, which makes the negotiations very hard. There's a lot of European concerns about this trade deal, much less than in the United States. Uh, but again, the idea of having a free trade deal with Europe is, is something she would support. The details, though, we'll have to see. Okay. Larry, Donald Trump and other politicians during this campaign cycle have stoked fears against Muslims and refugees um, with bombastic speeches on the campaign trail. The U.S. Congress also has passed a law barring individuals from the visa waiver program on the basis of their nationality, if they're dual nationals of Iran, Iraq, Syria, or Sudan. What will Senator Sanders do to tone down this rhetoric and ensure that laws don't discriminate on the basis of religion or nationality? Well, I think what he will do is he take a leadership role and explain, like, his family came from Poland to avoid the Holocaust. They came here. Uh, he, you know, is, uh, you know, raised as somebody who was Jewish, which is a minority, you know, in this country, and he wants all people to feel accepted. In fact, he said this regardless of their religion or ethnic background or anything. And again, what you have to do to make these things happen is you've got to make sure that the people you put into the job buy off on this because it's tough. And Derek can tell you, you've got a bureaucracy, and I mean that in a good sense. People have been there for years. They have things to do. You're going to have to get your own people in there and say, no, this is what we're going to do, okay? And, you know, and we're going to ensure that you speed up the visa waivers, you know, and do all of, all of this, uh, this stuff. And I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, basically, it's not just the election. It then, you know, what happens after it? Who do you put in and, and things like that? And I have written this, so I can't, you know, I think President Obama relied too much, Derek accepted here, too much on the foreign policy establishment, the people he put in. If you read today's, it's in tomorrow's New York Times, about when Obama wanted to, you know, put more troops into Afghanistan, and basically a lot of his own people were fighting against him. And I remember, because I worked in the campaign, his uh, legal advisor had said, we're going to keep Bob Gates, what do you think? I said, don't ever hire someone you can't fire, because he then can do, you know, he has a, you know, pretty much do what he wants. And basically, he didn't let Obama pick the person he wanted to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He wouldn't give him an alternative, you know, to the proposal put forward by, uh, you know, uh, uh, General McChrystal, in, in, you know, in terms of going into Afghanistan. So I think that's the key thing. You've got to make sure that you get people in there who buy off on your agenda and are not just looking for a job. And, and just to be clear, would Senator Sanders support or oppose these recently imposed restrictions on visa-free travel to the U.S. on Europeans and others them. who hold the dual yeah. nationality? Okay. Um, Derek Cholet, would Secretary Clinton support or oppose those recent restrictions? And also, what would she do, particularly if she's the candidate in the general election against Donald Trump, to tamp down anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim sentiment in this country? Well, uh, on the specific issue, uh, she supports where the administration has landed on this, which is obviously the legislation is the law of the land. There are certain waivers that the administration has talked about that she thinks is the smart way to go about this. And when it comes to issues of dual nationals for, or things like that, uh, it probably doesn't make sense uh, to have these visa waivers. But uh, when we're thinking about free travel between some of these conflict zones and the United States, it does make sense to have some check uh, in the system to ensure the terrorists are not coming into this country. 
we need to have some of those smart decisions, if nothing else, to ward off against the, the crazier ideas, the insane ideas, the terrible ideas that Donald Trump and the Republican Party have about how to handle this, which is just to build the walls higher and deport millions of people and not let any Muslim into the country, which is, which is terrible in a whole, for a whole host of reasons. Um, so I think that's one, of the, that's one of the keys to the larger question, which is how do you change the tone uh, in the country? Larry's right. This is about leadership. Again, going back to what I said earlier, this is where Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders present a vastly different image of the United States and set of policies than any of the Republican candidates. Uh, there are going to be minor differences on this issue, but they pale in comparison to what we would see from a Donald Trump or a Ted Cruz. All right. We're running close to the end of our time, so Larry, I'm going to ask you for a short answer on this question from our audience directed at you. Hillary Clinton as First Lady, Secretary of State, and in the Clinton Foundation has met with foreign leaders on different levels within government and outside government. Not only does she have experience, she has connect connections and networks and leverage. So what does Sanders have? Which networks does he have that he could possibly compensate for hers? He's got honesty and courage to tell people exactly what they need to hear from the United States. All right. Derek, quick rebuttal. Senator Sanders is, is a patriot. He loves his country. He spent most of his adult life in public service. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of experience in foreign policy. He's been in Congress for a long time. He hasn't really distinguished himself uh, on foreign policy. As far as I know, he doesn't serve on any oversight committees. During my time in government, I never really dealt with him. And sure, he had to vote a lot on these issues. But I'm unaware of many issues where he was a particular leader. That said, um, as I said, he's, he's a fine public servant. I just think when it comes to dealing with the important issues that we face in the world, the very difficult, tricky issues that we face in the world, there's no one on the planet that I can think of who has more experience and is better equipped to deal with those than Secretary Clinton. All right. I'd like to ask you both this final question, which is former senior director um, to the National Security Council on the Middle East, Philip Gordon, has stated that in Iraq, the U.S. intervened and occupied, and the result was a costly disaster. In Libya, the U.S. intervened and did not occupy, and the result was a costly disaster. In Syria, the U.S. neither intervened nor occupied, and the result is a costly disaster. So how can the U.S. better manage such crises in the Middle East to prevent costly disasters in the future? Larry, I'll let well, you Well, it's interesting. First. I was going to use that line because Phil Gordon is one of the uh, part of Hillary's team. Uh, look, and I think he put it, when I met with Senator Sanders the first time he asked to see me, we went over what I call the Weinberger-Powell doctrine that we developed after the horrible situation in Lebanon. And what you need to do is, okay, is this an existential threat that you've got to deal with right away? And if you can't, you know, diplomacy and stuff hasn't worked, are you willing to use military force? What is your objective, and when will you know you've achieved the objective? You know, there's two great books out recently. <clears throat> uh, one by Michael Mandelbaum, who I used to work with at the council, is now at Johns Hopkins, and Andy Basevich, a West Point graduate, fought in the first Gulf War, and his son got killed in the, in the, in the, in the Iraq, Iraq War. And they basically said, you know, they, we're not good at that. Yeah, we can go in and beat them militarily but nation building and, and dealing with the, you know, the after, we're not very, very good at. And Andy's book is 40 years of this is, has it worked, and Michael Mandelbaum is talking about how this is not, you know, where we're from. So I think before you do that, you've got to ask yourself, you know, are you willing to do that? Uh, <clears throat> one of the successful interventions, and Derek has, has written about it, is the Balkans. We still have peacekeepers there. Okay, we still have peacekeepers in the Sinai. So if you're not willing to do that for a long period of time, then think twice before you go ahead and, and do it. And here's another thing. Let me conclude with this. You're when still going to get your two minutes of concluding statements. Oh, okay. I'm done. <laughs> <Sorry>. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> Derek, can you answer that question about how to avoid I thought that was my last disasters. shot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, well, uh, look, I don't... I don't I disagree with the larger point that Larry's making. I don't disagree with my friend Bill Gordon in terms of his, his assessment of, of, uh, of those, those interventions or non-interventions. Uh, but I think the problem with Andy Basevich's book or Mandelbaum's argument is it's kind of, it's, they treat it as it's an on-off switch. That you're either all in, your Weinberger doctrine, it's 
Persian Gulf War I with 400,000 troops there, or you don't do anything. And of course, in the real world, it's, it's not that simple, right? And what, what, the, the, what we're doing right now today against ISIS is, is an effort that will take a long time, that is a calibrated approach to degrade, disrupt, and eventually defeat ISIS. But that's not something that's going to happen militarily with only the military instrument. The military instrument is vital, as I said earlier tonight. We're conducting a lot of airstrikes uh, in Iraq and Syria. We've got troops on the ground in Iraq. We've got special operators on the ground in Syria to try to build up uh, those indigenous forces and kind of the fine tradition of Dwight Eisenhower in building indigenous forces. Uh, we're working with coalition partners, and it's important to note that coalition partners continue to, to grow, come into the coalition and do more. This isn't what we saw in Iraq where we had a grand coalition under George W. Bush that then withered away with time. In fact. Since September 2014 and the ISIS campaign started, we've been adding countries to the coalition. And those that have been getting involved have been doing more. And that's a very important momentum to continue. But we do need to have a large degree of humility and not jump into these, uh, these crises head first, which is, oh, by the way, exactly what a Republican president would do. And that's why we need to be very mindful of the choice we have before us. All right, us. well, since our choice between us is between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders in this particular night, I'll ask you in your final arguments to sort of highlight those differences, since we're not now picking between a Democrat and Republican, <laughs> but between two Democrats. And um, I'd like you, if you will, in your following, in your final statements, and maybe we can extend the final statements to three minutes rather than two, <laughs> so you can take in this last question I had, which I see is also reflected in some of the cards I got from the audience. So in his 2002 speech in which he announced his opposition to the war in Iraq, President Obama said that the U.S. should fight to make sure that our so-called allies in the Middle East, the Saudis and the Egyptians, stop oppressing their own people and suppressing dissent and tolerating corruption and inequality. But military support for both of those countries has continued under the Obama presidency despite rampant human rights concerns. So does the U.S. need to do more to pressure our allies and others in the region to uphold their human rights obligations? If you could address that as part of your closing remarks, each of you. So since Larry, you got to start, okay. we'll let, okay. uh, we'll let yeah. Derek begin with his final okay. remarks. Uh, well, just specifically on, on that last question, yes, we need to be very clear with our allies around the world in the Middle East and elsewhere when they uh, conduct policies that are inconsistent with our values uh, and universal human rights, uh, that we have a problem with that. That said, uh, I don't believe we hold our entire relationship hostage to that. It's an important factor, uh, but in the case of Egypt, the case of Saudi Arabia, we have many important issues, and there's, a, there's important military ties uh, I think are necessary for our own common security right now. Um, you know, dear, I've been through too many debate preps to know that on the last question, you never answer the moderator's question. <laughs> you say what you want to say. And, then, and what I want to say, and then I really mean this, is that, and, you know, Larry and I have had a lot of fun. We, we're friends, we respect each other, we've been colleagues for a long time. And it's very, uh, you know, it, it's, in this debate, it's been in, uh, widely between Senator Sanders and Secretary Clinton, it's very, uh, it magnifies differences, right? But let's just remember the choice in November and all that we've talked about tonight. Uh, if a Republican president is elected, there's no question about how we're in implementing the climate change deal. That president is denying that climate change is a problem scientifically. There's no question of how are we going to close Gitmo and could we, could we do better at that. It's how we keep Gitmo open and how do we de add detainees to Gitmo. Uh, it's not about how can we implement the Iran deal and who would be the better diplomat in doing that. It's about unwinding the Iran deal starting on day one. It's about how can we better persecute the, the military campaign against ISIS or whether that's a smart idea in the first place. It's about torturing people, bringing that back. It's not about a visa waiver program. It's about building a high wall and uh, deporting 11 million people and not letting in every Muslim. So this is all a way of saying this is a really important election. This is not some just academic debate. It's going to really matter who the next president is. And it's going to really matter that the next president has the experience and the policies that are necessary to tackle these very tough issues. And this is something that I think Secretary Clinton, in her many years in public service, her many years in the arena, her many years taking fire politically from the press, from her political enemies, from tough adversaries around the world, has shown 
her moxie. She's shown her resilience. She's shown her ability to keep, stay positive and to paint a brighter picture of the world despite all of the things uh, that can bring us down and make us depressed. So I just, I really encourage all of you and for folks watching at home to think very hard about this election. There's an important vote here in Maryland uh, next week because we need to elect a Democrat. Uh, you know, as I said, Senator Sanders, he, he's a patriot. He's run a terrific campaign. He's exceeded expectations. But Secretary Clinton, in my mind, is clearly the better candidate, and she will be the better president. Larry. <clears throat> All right, let me begin with the things you uh, raised. And thanks so much for moderating this. I think it's been great. Um, I think Senator Sanders would focus more on the values than our interests. In other words, he would not let these people get away the, the way they have. And he would, I think, uh, implement the, uh, the, the policies that President Obama talked about in 2002. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, if you go back and you take a look at the Iraq war vote, a lot of people voted for it because they were concerned politically. Some of you are too young to remember what it was like in the country after 9-11. I happened to be working at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, and there was this hysteria. Senator Max Cleland from Georgia, a triple amputee from Vietnam, lost the next election because he voted the wrong way, and they had things of bin Laden you know, behind him. In the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in 1964, which was cooked up, too, to justify us going to, going to war, two senators voted against it. They both lost the next election. So to have the courage to stand up, I think that's what I look for in a leader. Uh, in terms of experience, he's got more experience than Bill Clinton had in foreign policy when he came in. Okay? If you're going by experience, George H.W. Bush should have won the 92 election. Okay? So that is not it. It's the courage. It's the conviction. And I had the privilege of working for President Reagan. A lot of people misunderstand him. But I watched him after the horrible thing in Lebanon. And all the hawks said, let's blow them off the face of the earth. Let's bomb the back of valley. And he said, no, you'll kill innocent people. That's not who we are. And then when Gorbachev came in into the Soviet uh, Union, he said, we can talk with each other. Bob Gates said, oh, he's a Stalinist. Newt Gingrich called him a, you know. You've got to be able to do that because it could have turned out the wrong way. And that's what I like about Senator Sanders. He's not afraid to take on these big issues. We talked about his speech to APAC. Go and read his speech compared to all the other candidates in terms of you know, what, uh, you know, what, the, what, they, what they said. You know, when he's talking about, uh, you know, dealing with Russia, let's not use military, you know, use mil military force. Let's get our allies to do more. Those things are, you know, easy to say. They're hard to implement. But I can tell you from my experience with them, he will not be afraid to do it. So thank you very much. All right. I want to thank both Derek Cholet for Hillary Clinton's campaign and Larry Korb for Bernie Sanders' campaign and, of course, University of Maryland um, School for Public Policy and NIAC for hosting us tonight. And thank you all so much for coming and for watching on the live stream. You're so let's give them a round of state. applause. <laughs> <laughs>